Hi folks, my name is Zach Finn and I'm the Education Outreach Coordinator at the Sword House Museum. Uh, this was supposed to be a live video. Uh, there were some technical difficulties, so we are going to upload a pre-recorded video uh, to our YouTube channel. While there, check out the uh, past four or five videos that we've done in this series. Um, but today's topic is something that is near and dear to my heart. We are going to be talking about the Seward Family Library and what they were reading during the 19th century. Uh, so without further ado, let me pull up my PowerPoint. And we can get started. Uh, so this lecture is titled, I Cannot Exist Without Books, a uh, quote taken from Seward as he's writing a letter about something he's read. Uh, we'll see that letter a little later on, um, but our focus is going to be the Seward's and their library. Uh, here you see a picture of that amazing space for uh, any of our visitors who have been to the Seward House in the past. Um, I know when you walk through the parlor, it's unbelievable. You see all this evidence of the family's travels, uh, very ornate, a very impressive room. But when you step into that library, the second room on the tour, uh, it's almost overwhelming. It's really where it settles in that this is a, a original collection to the family. You know, when you step into this room that is just, and you are surrounded by thousands of books that the family engaged with, uh, throughout their life. It's a pretty powerful moment and I think for a lot of people it's where uh, they really start to realize you know the role that the Seward's had during the 19th century. Uh, personally it's always been my favorite room in the house which is probably why this lecture is focused on it. Um, but for today's uh, uh, lecture we're going to narrow down the focus opposed to uh, looking at the family's reading habits as a whole. We're going to boil it down to four specific readers uh, just for the sake of time. Uh, the first one we'll be looking at is William Henry Seward, uh, who would serve as Secretary of State in the Lincoln and Johnson administration, uh, famous for Seward's folly or the purchase of the uh, Alaska territories. Uh, Seward would also work as a lawyer. He was an avid traveler. And all these uh, careers and interests would inspire what he was reading throughout his life. We are also going to look at the reading habits of his wife, Frances Seward. Uh, Frances would be uh, extremely well-educated uh, she is also going to be a uh, radical abolitionist and peripherally involved in the women's rights movement. In fact, Francis would spearhead using the house as a stop on the Underground Railroad during the 1850s. So we'll be looking at some of the books that she was reading uh, during her time in Auburn. Next, we're going to skip over uh, the Seward's oldest son, Gus Seward, although he does pop up briefly thanks to a letter uh, that his mother writes to him. Uh, we are going to look next at Frederick Seward, who is going to literally follow in his father's footsteps as Assistant Secretary of State. Uh, Frederick Seward would go on to write an autobiography, reminiscent of a wartime a diplomat and statesman. Uh, so we really get some access into what Frederick Seward is reading throughout his life thanks to that autobiography. Again, we are going to skip over Will Jr. And Will Jr. does have a pretty impressive uh, reading footprint of his own. In fact, uh, he ends up donating the Working Man's Library to Auburn in the 1880s. Uh, its purpose was to provide a free reading room for the use of mechanics, laborers, and young men generally who desire to keep up with the current topics of the time. Uh, the Seward Reading Room would be located on Exchange Street, right in Auburn, and averages around, around 40,000 visitors a year. Uh, still, despite this, we are going to uh, skip over Will Jr.'s reading habits, at least for this talk, and really dive into what Fanny Seward was reading. Fanny Seward uh, was an avid, uh, avid reader. She was an aspiring author. There's also been a lot of scholarship written, uh, wrote about what Fanny Seward was reading throughout her life. In, the, in this picture here, we can see her library and an early Matthew Brady photograph, which is uh, above there. A little difficult to see, but uh, Fanny Seward very much leaves a physical imprint on the library. And we're gonna dive into what her reading habits were during the time. Uh, kind of the overall goal of this lecture is looking at the reading trends of those selected stewards and seeing how books influence, you know, the way they thought, their understanding of the 19th century, and, you know, perhaps explain some of their actions during this turbulent time. Now, before we dive into the stewards uh, specifically, uh, we're going to look at how reading culture was changing during the 19th century. And one of the things that brought about this change was a rapid development in technological advancements uh, regarding printing uh, during this time. So it starts at the end of the 18th century, but really picks up in the 19th century uh, when the wooden screw press eventually gives way to the steam press. 
This starts in the early 18 teens, but it's in 1814 uh, when the Times acquires one of these uh, that, again, printed material is just uh, much easily produced. Uh, to quantify what the steam press does, uh, it is capable of printing a thousand sheets per hour, which was over five times the number than the previous wooden screw press could do in that same time. So starting in the 18 teens, you see a lot uh, more books, a lot more newspapers being produced. And then in the 1840s, that is uh, equally increased with the adoption of the steam powered rotary press. And both those new technological advances uh, really change and make a uh, reading material more accessible. So along with uh, more reading material being produced, uh, there's also kind of the assumption that what is produced uh, would be uniform, the ex expectation that no matter where you bought a book, it would be similar to other editions uh, made at the same time. So people are, are calling for more uniform metadata during this time. And as the technological advances allow for the production of more books and written material, it is also reaching an increasingly more literate population. So literacy rates were on the rise during the 19th century, uh, thanks to a more regulated and uh, formula formulated um, schooling uh, training. So teachers are beginning to train at normal schools, which were two-year programs designed to prepare teachers before they stepped in front of the classroom. Uh, so you start to see teaching preparation become a little bit more regulated, um, and education in general is becoming a little bit more accessible uh, during this time. Uh, certainly during Seward's gubernatorial career as governor of New York, education reform became a, a really crucial component of his platform. Um, but in 1860, um, over 90% of the native born white Americans could read. So you just see a rapid expansion in literate Americans during this time. Similarly, you see more written and um, material being accessible. Um, so the reading habits of the 19th century are very much uh, changing during this time. Now those books that were being produced might look a little bit different than what we're familiar to familiar with in the 21st century. Uh, novels and stories could be produced in a number of ways. Uh, some of these would be serialized, uh, most famous as Penny Dreadfuls or American Dime novels. Um, so these would oftentimes leave with a cliffhanger. They would be very cheap and these stories would focus on almost on horror stories. They would focus on mysteries. Um, and again, very cheap. You could purchase these um, and People were you know, constantly reading these as a form of entertainment. Another development are what's called triple deckers. And here you can see a couple pictures of examples of triple deckers throughout the house. And this was something that was really interesting to read about. So what triple deckers were, uh, they would be a novel or a story divided into three separate parts. Uh, here you could see you know, volume one, volume two, volume three, but it would be a continuing narrative. And the reason they did this uh, publishers love triple deckers because they would use part one to generate interest. It would also pay for the uh, subsequent publishing of the next two series. So very uh, economically sound in that practice. You would use the first volume, use it almost to market the rest of the series, uh, and then people would uh, be interested in purchasing the next two. Uh, the other kind of driver and uh, people who really enjoyed the triple deckers were commercial librarians, because rather than renting one book and only getting one rental uh, charge, uh, people would have to rent all three to finish a series. So commercial librarians were pretty big fans of uh, the triple deckers as well. You'd also see cheap single volume yellowbacks. You saw paperbacks began to emerge during this time. There were more pricey first editions, uh, which if you visit the Seward House Museum, a lot of those are first editions of books. Um, but there are several different ways to read, um, lots of changing, uh, changes to uh, the practice of publishing during this time. Um, and just to kind of, again, quantify these changes, uh, publishers began offering books at several different prices, as we can see here. In 1829, an edition of 6,500 books would have been considered quite large. And by 1860, around 30 years after that, uh, editions of 10,000 books were quite common and uh, not rare anymore. So uh, books are being produced at a much more rapid and price efficient rate. And this was happening all over, not just in uh, cities like London and New York City, but publishing and bookstores were also uh, appearing in places like Auburn, New York. Let me move this here. 
There we go. Uh, two gentlemen in particular were responsible for this. Uh, here we see Henry Iveson and James Derby. Now Iveson uh, began his career, uh, he immigrated from Scotland to the United States. Uh, after making his way to the United States, he would go on to apprentice with William Williams. Uh, Williams would also train with Thurlow Weed, a uh, kingsmaker during the 19th century who starts out uh, his career as a journeyman printer and who would go on later to serve as rich political advisor. Uh, so Iveson is training with Williams Eventually, Williams is contacted by James Seymour from Auburn, New York, who is interested in opening up a bookstore and publisher uh, in central New York. Henry Avison uh, decides to send his, uh, his, uh, his uh, trainee in, uh, or Williams rather, decides to send his trainee in Iveson uh, to Auburn, New York, which is how Ivan opens up his bookstore and publishing company there. Uh, here we see a description of that original store. Uh, the store in Auburn had only one counter, but one side was completely filled with books. Uh, this was pretty impressive during this time, especially operating in central New York. Uh, it attracted the patronage of Martin Van Buren, who had a rental house on Owasco Lake, and it quickly established itself in the region as Henry Iveson is establishing himself as a publisher and as a uh, book salesman. He also uh, attracts a understudy in uh, James Derby, who we see here uh, with quite the beard on him. Now, Derby would uh, train with Iveson specifically as a book clerk origi uh, originally before stepping into publication himself. Uh, Derby would continue on in uh, publishing throughout the rest of his life, ultimately stepping into the role of author, writing 50 years among authors, books, and publishers, and it's here where we really get some great insight into Seward's reading habits. Uh, because Derby is so familiar with Seward, uh, starting at a young age when he's oftentimes selling books uh, to this politically ambitious young man in Seward, uh, Derby basically tracks his career uh, throughout his life. Wherever Seward goes, interestingly enough, Derby is kind of following him working in similar positions where he always has some pretty interesting insight into what Seward is doing throughout his life. In fact, in Derby's autobiography, there's a whole chapter dedicated to William Henry Seward. He talks about uh, famous authors, uh, political figures who visit this bookstore, and Derby would be a uh, help published 12 years or more by Solomon Northup. And all of this is uh, written in 50 years among authors, books, and publishers. Very interesting read. Um, if you're interested in uh, looking at it, uh, you can go to archive.org, and that is public domain, so you can look at it on your computer. Um, but Auburn was establishing itself as a hub of publishing and uh, as a place to purchase books, making it, of course, the perfect location for a family uh, like the Sewards who are very interested in reading uh, throughout their time. Now, I should make note here that uh, the Seward family were not traditional 19th century uh, readers. They were uh, very wealthy, very well established in the community. Their reading habits don't necessarily reflect what most people were reading and the ease of access that they might have uh, to books during the 19th century. Uh, so we are looking at, you know, a very particular family in a very particular place in society. Uh, still, there's a lot of information that we can learn from it, um, which is still quite important. Now, here we see the Seward family parlor. And for those of you who have been to the museum before, this is the first room that you're taken into uh, after you walk through the front doors. And this would essentially be a greeting room. This is where social callers would uh, visit the Seward family, perhaps have a 10 or 15 minute conversation with them. And it's around the parlor room table in this space where people would oftentimes, being having, would oftentimes have conversations about the, what they were reading. Uh, for a family like the Seward family, uh, who was constantly reading, constantly engaging with books, uh, they would be having conversations about what they were reading with these social callers. And the ideal for the 19th century reader is, is rather fluid. It's constantly changing and it's pretty complicated. Uh, what people should be reading is debated among social critics. Uh, it's uh, debated based on one's standing in society. So reading and the particular focus of one's reading is constantly debated during this time. But in general, uh, to kind of uh, paint a very general overview, uh, reading was regarded as a worthwhile pursuit. It promoted useful knowledge. It was a rational pursuit. But there were some topics and some subjects that uh, families such as the Sewards uh, were kind of expected to be engaging with. 
and we're having conversations with, uh, with their social callers and visitors. And so important uh, for families like the Sewards uh, about uh, the topics of reading, you know, what books they were engaging with, that there were actually books produced uh, telling people what they should be reading. Here we see an example of one of those uh, titles, which comes from Seward Strong Room. Uh, this book is called Books and Reading, or What Book Shall I Read and How Shall I Read Them? And this book is published, uh, written in 1872 by Noah Porter. Uh, here's a quote from within. The importance of the subject is not only great, but it is constantly increasing. Books as an element of influence are becoming more and more important, and reading is the employment of a widening circle. So more people were reading, and you had to make sure to stay on top of what the most popular titles were during the time, so you could carry on those conversations uh, when you visited people's parlors. But it wasn't just for impressing people. That wasn't the only reason people during the 19th century uh, read. And uh, just like in the 21st century, reading served several purposes. People could read for education as a form of escapism, uh, for enjoyment, communal and family bonding, development of self or self-fashioning, as we'll see a little bit later on in the talk. There are several different reasons to read, uh, same as today. Um, and here's a really great quote uh, taken from Caroline Chester, who attended the Litchfield Female Academy, a uh, private school in Connecticut, where young women trained in social conversation by reading aloud. And in her journal, she writes that books were where she learned how to live. That's an important statement. When we talk about self-fashioning later on, uh, it'll kind of come back to this, that for a lot of people, they were able to engage in new ideas, new thoughts, uh, new experiences by engaging with these books that were becoming more popular and more accessible during this time. So reading was extremely important to kind of broadening uh, the way one thought um, as they were growing up. And here we're going to start diving into the Seward's Library in particular. As I mentioned, by far my favorite room in the house. I think for a lot of our visitors, uh, they would echo that sentiment. Here we see a very early picture of the library. Uh, this would be considered the North Library, a uh, portrait, of course, of Seward and Francis. Here we see uh, portraits of Mexico City and Pueblo below, the boss relief that Seward picks up during his travels. Uh, the library was very much like a study where there, uh, along with the books that on the wall surrounding them, there are artifacts that Seward picks up during his travels. And it's described by a visitor in 1870 as such. After you pass from the North Parlor into Mr. Seward's favorite library, from here there are two rooms lined with books all around, from floor to ceiling. This one, uh, again the North Library, contains the books and photographs and other objects that are in a special manner Mr. Seward's favorite. But what touches and interested me more than anything else was to see in one corner of the room the library dedicated to his dead daughter. We'll talk about a Fanny story later on. But the library they're mentioning, if you've been to the Seward house before, uh, typically sits right here to the left of the boss relief. Um, but it's in this library where the family would spend much of its time together. Oftentimes younger members of the family would read to older members of the family. Uh, in total, the Seward's library consists of over 5,000 books, the oldest being a 1698 complete collection of the works of John Milton. Uh, some of the newer titles coming from the 1840s and very early 1850s, uh, having belonged to Will III, uh, the last steward uh, to live in the house before donating it to become a museum. Uh, Will III was very interested in hunting and outdoor pursuits. His library, if you visit, is going to sit to the very left of the boss relief, kind of between Fanny, Fanny's library uh, and that boss relief. Um, but it's a pretty impressive collection when you visit. Which leads us to the first steward we're going to talk about, Francis Seward. Uh, here we see a picture of her doing what else but reading uh, towards the end of her life. Uh, Frances Seward would be born in 1805 and she would live until 1865, uh, passing away shortly after the end of the American Civil War. And to kind of uh, summarize her reading habits, uh, this comes from a letter that she writes to her older son in which she tells him that as you grow older, you'll find your taste for reading a source of pleasure, which will offer an exhaustible satisfaction. Uh, for Frances, she very much enjoyed reading. And before we jump into what Francis Sawyer is reading in particular, um, 
let me start, let me preface it with, so Frances Seward was involved in the Underground Railroad. She was involved in, uh, peripherally in the women's rights movement, very involved in progressive moments during this time. And most of the books I'm gonna talk about today are going to be uh, readings that she turned to more for enjoyment uh, rather than books that she was engaging with to kind of tease out these ideas and these movements which she would find herself a part of. The reason for that is when the museum reopens, uh, we have a new exhibit and uh, I didn't want to give any spoilers. Um, so we're going to be focusing a little bit more on what Frances Seward uh, was reading more for enjoyment and less for uh, challenging herself to uh, find herself in these movements that she would eventually become a part of. Uh, so with that, now we can start talking about those specific topics. Uh, Frances Stewart enjoyed reading uh, several different books that we'll see a list of shortly. Uh, she received an excellent education, uh, attending the Troy Female Seminary, which was founded in 1821 by Emma Willard, uh, really kind of a trailblazer in education. Uh, and the Troy Female Seminary aimed to provide young women with the same higher education that would be afforded to a young man during this time. So while there, Francis would study mathematics, science, modern languages, Latin, history, philosophy, geography, uh, literature. Uh, it, the Troy Female Seminary also functioned as a normal school, so it was uh, training teachers as well. And it's important to note that although Francis would receive an education that was comparable to anything any young male would receive during this time, uh, she didn't have the same opportunities upon graduation. In fact, when you look at the almost the mission statement of the Troy Female Seminary during this time, again, which was offering young women an education comparable to anything uh, any young boy is going to receive, uh, its, its uh, mission statement was to educate the women for responsible motherhood and train some of them to be teachers. So while Frances was extremely well educated, uh, an intellectual in her own right and involved in these progressive moment and these progressive movements, uh, she wouldn't be afforded the same opportunities uh, that say uh, William Henry Seward, her husband would have been uh, during this time. Um, still uh, throughout the rest of her life, Frances is going to be continually uh, reading. Uh, um, she's also going to help uh, train her uh, children uh, in reading, which is, it'll be funny when we come back to this letter where she's talking about Gus, um, but for many children during the 19th century, their first exposure to reading uh, would be uh, while they were working with their mothers, and this happens with the Sewards. Uh, Frances Seward would be training Fanny Seward, uh, who couldn't attend a private school for most of her life due to the fact that she was suffering from bouts of ill health, uh, so Frances would be reading constantly with her children, exposing them uh, to the written word, and it also became a lifeline and a connection between her family members uh, as they moved about. One example of this can be seen in this letter that she writes in 1831 to William Henry Seward. Uh, here she's reading The Water Witch. Uh, the Water Witch was written in 1831 by James Fenimore Cooper, a very early literary uh, naval work. Uh, uh, its uh, focus is maritime fiction, and it features the abduction of a woman by a pirate and the subsequent chase by a uh, naval commander to, a, uh, to rescue said woman. And you know, in even that brief story outline, you see several of the tropes that still exist in uh, stories and movies today. I'm sure everyone here can think of at least three movies off the top of their head that basically follow that same storyline. Now, Francis read The Water Witch, as did Seward. They wrote a letter to each other discussing their thoughts on the books. And Francis wasn't very impressed with it. Uh, she says that she stayed up all night to read The Water Witch, that she had dreams about it, um, but except for the two or three last chapters, she thinks the book was very uninteresting, many parts very improbable. improbable. Uh, the only characters that at all interested me were the Skimmer and Eudora. Alita is as insipid as Cooper's heroines usually are. Uh, so reading it, she criticizes the blandness of one of the female's leads. Um, but this form of communication between Francis and Seward became quite regular. Uh, starting in 1830, Seward would begin his political career, which would see him make his way to Albany as a New York State Senator. Uh, from there, he would go on to serve as a New York State Governor, a United States Senator, and ultimately Secretary of State. When he wasn't involved in politics, he was involved as a land agent. Uh, he also worked as a lawyer. He was traveling all over the place. So much of the family's communication would be uh, through letters, which is really where we get some insight into what they're reading um, 
as a line of communication. They're writing letters back and forth to each other, talking about what they're reading. And it's again, it's almost kind of a social and communal component of reading during this time. They're having a conversation about it, um, which we see extends throughout uh, Seward's and Francis's relationship. Now, I won't read this verbatim, but some of the other books that Francis was reading during uh, her life, uh, we see religious texts starting with this first one. These next two are particularly interesting. Uh, they're social commentaries, but also travels throughout the United States. Um, this third bullet point after uh, just reading of Miss Martineau's last work on America, which was quite an undertaking for Francis uh, to accomplish in a week. Uh, so this would be a retrospect of Western travel. And uh, just to give you an idea of how much Francis was reading in that week, volume one was over 300 pages. So that's a pretty impressive rate of reading. Uh, but she's reading social commentaries that we see here. She's also reading history, uh, which we see with this last bullet, bullet point, uh, reading about the conquest of Peru by the Spanish. She describes it as being a tale of cruelty and blood. And kind of an interesting uh, footnote or side note, um, when, if you were to open up the book today, uh, which obviously we can't without our curator's permission, uh, there's actually a press flower uh, in, the in the title pages. Um, so just kind of an interesting comparison that it's described as a tale of cruelty and blood, and they end up putting a fresh um, flower or uh, dried flower in it as well. Um, but these are all titles that Frances is reading throughout her life. Uh, when the museum opens back up, when we uh, are able to open up that new exhibit, you'll see some of the other texts that Frances was engaging with as well. Uh, so an avid reader, uh, who would try and continue that on uh, in her family. Here we see Gus Seward, the oldest child born to Seward and Francis. Uh, during our tour, when we introduce the next generation of the Seward family, I think most of our volunteers, myself inclu included, kind of introduce Gus as the Seward we know the least about. Doesn't really leave behind a written trail, constantly moving, uh, serves in the military as a paymaster, moving base to base. Uh, so just doesn't have the same written trail that his family members do. Um, but in 1842, while Gus Seward is attending West Point, uh, his mother writes him a letter inspiring him to read more. Uh, she tells him, for the future, my child, during vacation, select some proper book or allow me to select it for you and read it at least one hour every day. I do not fear to promise you that you will find at the termination of your vacation a fondness for reading, which will have materially increased. So in this letter, she's trying to convince Gus Seward to read a little bit more, but she follows up with concerns over their next oldest child, Frederick Seward, that Fred's vacation terminates tomorrow. I have not been able to persuade him to spend as much of it in the open air as he ought. I fear he will never acquire much physical strength until he can be persuaded to leave books alone for a season. So while she was concerned that Gus Seward wasn't reading enough, she was also concerned that Fred was reading a little bit too much. And that leads us as an introduction to Fred Seward. Uh, here we see him uh, sitting here. Um, interestingly enough, there's not a lot of material left over of Fred's books. And I'll talk about a potential reason why uh, later on in the lecture. But luckily for us, Fred Sh Frederick Seward is uh, kind enough to write an autobiography. So while we don't know a lot about Gus Seward, we know a lot about Frederick Seward. Uh, in this autobiography, he talks about some of the early readings that he's reading as a child. Uh, here's some different uh, quotes where he talks about reading uh, Puss in Boots and Mother Hubbard. For anyone who's read uh, Fred Seward's autobiography, it's written very interestingly. When he's talking about his, young, uh, his younger years growing up, he actually writes in uh, present tense. So uh, here we see, we are ready to lay aside even Puss in, Puss in Boots and Mother Hubbard. And he's talking about going to re uh, listen to a story about the American Revolution from his uh, grandmother. But his early life is written in present tense, which makes it very strange to read, uh, but also very interesting and very telling. Uh, he also talks about how during his uh, early training, uh, he would work on Aesop's fables, preferring the Latin version. And then here he talks about some time he spent with his father uh, while Seward was governor of New York. Uh, at the office, which was lighted and warmed, even when not occupied, I found it a quiet and comfortable place to read or study my lessons. On the bookshelves were Irving, Shakespeare, and Charles Lamb. And once a month came Oliver Twist or Nicholas Nickleby or Ainsworth's Lurid Tower of London, 
while the New Yorker and the Mirror came every week. So there was no lack of good reading. And it's kind of Frank's, uh, Frederick's ideal uh, situation, constantly reading. When he wasn't studying uh, for school, he was oftentimes uh, reading for enjoyment. Um, now, I mentioned that we don't have a huge imprint of Frederick Stewart on the Stewart Library uh, currently. And there's a potential reason for this. Um, so there are a few books specifically in Fanny Stewart's library where uh, kind of indicative of gift giving, uh, where Frederick Stewart would read a book, perhaps give it to Fanny Stewart. Uh, and it's very likely that his uh, personal library was quite large. Um, but unfortunately, this beautiful house to the right uh, Montrose on the Hudson, which Seward and his wife Ann, Anna would move to after retiring from uh, public office in Washington, D.C., uh, would burn down shortly following Frederick's death. Uh, Fred would die in 1915. Uh, the house would suffer a fire, and it appears that a lot of the physical possessions uh, contained within would be lost in that fire, which might explain why there's not a huge amount of books belonging to Frederick that find their way in the Seward House Museum. Still, despite the fact that Frederick Stewart's library is most likely lost, uh, his autobiography constantly references reading. Uh, again, these are some of the titles that appear throughout his autobiography. In total, books are mentioned 33 times throughout, a uh, reading 22 times. Uh, during 1866, when uh, him and his father visit the Dutch-owned Virgin Islands, kind of scoping out the area for potential territorial expansion, uh, while they're basically taking a leisurely cruise there. Uh, uh, Frederick Stewart talks about reading on the deck. Uh, this is something that he did throughout his life. And luckily we've got his autobiography, which kind of paints an interesting uh, breakdown of what he was reading at each various stage. Now here we are going to move on from Frederick, again, skipping over Will Jr., even though he would eventually have fund a library we're gonna jump into the story of Fanny Seward, an aspiring author, avid reader, and someone who has a lot of scholarship written about her reading habits. Uh, here we see a picture of Fanny Seward, as well as a quote uh, taken from her journals in which she says, I find reading a great help in distracting attention and changing the mind's current. And Fanny Seward is growing up during the 1850s and the 1860s, which saw the American Civil War. Uh, so having something like reading to distract her was of course, probably very uh, important uh, as she sees this terrible war uh, rage on throughout her life. Now, Fanny's library, uh, that library that is mentioned by the newspaper reporter uh, sitting in the corner, um, which is dedicated to her after her passing in 1866, consists of 348 titles, which are essentially frozen in the moment of her young death at 21. Uh, she passes away in Washington, D.C. of tuberculosis. These books are oftentimes uh, include Fanny's signature, along with the date of acquisition uh, in about a quarter of the volumes. In rare cases, you do see the signature of her father or her brothers, uh, kind of hinting at a gift giving culture with books. Um, but for anyone who's really interested in an excellent micro history and really a deep dive into what Fanny Seward was reading throughout her life, I highly recommend checking out Deidre Stam's uh, article titled Growing Up With Books, Fanny Seward's Book Collecting, Reading, and Writing in the Mid-19th Century New York. This is an excellent article. Again, an excellent example of microhistory, how this very kind of small story of Fanny's library and uh, what's left over can really tell us a lot about history and Fanny's experience growing up. Uh, so if you're interested in learning more about family, check out that article. It is excellent. Uh, uh, Stam goes through and actually takes the dates uh, that Fanny Seward writes in the books I believe she dates about a quarter of them and traces year by year what Fanny Stewart was reading, really giving us some interesting insight into, you know, Fanny's reading habits as she grows up. Now, within Fanny Stewart's library, here are some of the more popular titles uh, that are included within. Uh, Theodore Winthrop was her favorite author um, by far. And as I mentioned, Stam is goes through and year by year breaks down exactly the type of titles that Fanny was reading throughout each year of her life, starting uh, from ages four to 10, where she's reading stories about children, uh, pets, rhymes, religiously oriented works, uh, which included how to properly behave, all the way through till her passing year um, at the age of 21, where she's primarily reading religion and poetry. So that article does a really good job providing the insight into what Fanny was reading. Uh, and it also introduces how Fanny uh, used reading as a social interaction. 
uh, here we see a quote from Sam's article in which he talks about a more intimate and revealing scene of Fanny's reading uh, comes from her description of visiting Aunt Margaret, an African-American friend of the family who in Washington, uh, who lived in Washington, D.C. and who herself could not read on January 22nd, 1860, and again on April 7th, 1872, uh, Fan 1862, I apologize, Fanny reported visiting her elderly friend and reading aloud to her. So here's an example of Fanny uh, reading aloud to someone, again, practicing kind of the social component of reading that we saw throughout the 19th century. Uh, in her journal, Fanny would also talk about reading out loud to her friends in Auburn. Growing up, she references reading uh, aloud to her older family members as a way to practice reading and uh, vocalization. So this social component of reading uh, was very important to Fanny Seward uh, throughout her life as was uh, this component of self-fashioning. Uh, so here are taken from reading women or uh, women reading. Uh, reading and books specifically made a reading vehicle for what the Renaissance scholar Stephen Greenblatt has called self-fashioning. And this is the achievement of a distinctive personality, a particular address to the world, a way of acting and thinking, sometimes books confirmed an already familiar identity, and sometimes they became, became catalysts in the fashioning of alternative selves. And for Fanny, this is, I think, especially important when you compare her reading habits compared to some of her other family members. Uh, Fanny Seward grew up in this tumultuous time. She grew up in a very unique situation uh, where she would spend long times in Auburn, New York, um, but she would also see the nation's capital quite frequently during the Civil War years. And it's during her time in Washington, D.C., where she's being introduced to personal heroes like Charlotte Cushman, uh, Edwin Booth. She's attending these dinner parties with international uh, diplomats and foreign ministers. So she's being thrust into these very public uh, political displays where she's meeting her hero. She's meeting important international political figures. And for someone who is uh, a, either a teenager or in her early 20s during the time of these dinner parties, uh, for someone who describes herself as being a bit shy, uh, that had to be immensely difficult. And it, um, Fanny oftentimes uh, is reading throughout these experiences. So along with uh, serving as kind of an escapism uh, during this chaotic 19th century, uh, for someone like Fanny, turning to her books would also allow someone to practice uh, this self-fashioning or uh, read about how to a, a way to act or a way to think in public that might be outside of someone's immediate experience. Basically, it exposes them to, for uh, new uh, ways to act uh, as Fanny was thrust into these uh, very particular situations, which were most likely initially quite difficult for someone uh, to be thrust into. Now, lastly, uh, we're gonna dive into the reading habits of William Henry Seward. Uh, here we see Seward towards the end of his life, surrounded by books and maps, uh, most likely while he's working on his own travel memoir, which would go on to be a bestseller. Uh, we're going to break Seward's reading habits into primarily two different sections, so his early career and then his retirement. Um, so much of what we know about what Seward was reading throughout his life comes from 50 years uh, amongst authors, books, and publishers by Derby in which Derby uh, recounts that the bookstore was generally the resort of cultivated men of the stamp of Mr. Seward. As a clerk there, I often waited upon him, especially when any new or important book was received and appeared for sale. Again, this would have been early 1830s, uh, probably right before Seward's, uh, right, or following right after Seward's time as a New York State Senator. Uh, this bookstore would become a place where Seward would bring some of his uh, guests as they visited him in Auburn, New York, one such guest, uh, Washington Irving, uh, so it brings to, uh, brings to H. Iveson and co-booksellers. He makes a whole scene about it. Derby's pretty funny when he's writing about it, about how Seward like, walks in, draws attention to himself, is asking for Washington Irving's most recent book, and like, makes a demand that he wants a signed copy. And Iveson says, we don't have a signed copy. And then Seward kind of makes a show of having Washington Irving appear and sign the book in front of him. Uh, so Derby's story about that is pretty funny. Uh, Irving was visiting Seward on his way uh, further west in New York to a family wedding. Um, but where else would Seward bring Washington Irving during this time but to a bookstore in Auburn, New York? Uh, 
Now, throughout Seward's early life, he's primarily engaging with nonfiction titles, reading mostly political works. Uh, his titles from 1830 to about 1850 kind of highlight a focus on New York state level politics. Um, following his retirement, it kind of increases to an international scope, which we'll talk about momentarily. Uh, Washington Irving, though remembered best as a fiction writer uh, and his short stories, he also wrote several uh, biographies of, uh, um, he writes a biography about George Washington, interestingly enough. Uh, so he's also writing nonfiction work as well. Uh, perhaps that's the book Stuart purchases um, while at Iverson's. And then here is the quote from which the title of this lecture comes from. Uh, this is a letter that Seward is writing to Francis in which he states, I'm reading the last volume of Brown's philosophy. I know not yet what I am to read after that. That's how good this book was, life-changing. Seward doesn't think anything will ever top it, uh, but yet he cannot exist without books. Uh, just again, uh, Seward was constantly turning to written works throughout his career. And Derby describes that, exactly what type of books Seward would purchase while in Auburn. Uh, purchases were books of a more solid kind, the classics, history, and law books. Uh, many of these books most likely decorate our Northern Library today. And these books would influence Seward's uh, political career, certainly. Uh, he was reading books about uh, the Louisiana Purchase, kind of influencing his later territorial expansion. Another example of one of Seward's books that's in his library that has a direct impact on his political and legal career is the Treaties on Insanity and Other Disorders Affecting the Mind by James Carlos Pritchard. Uh, James Carlos Pritchard was a physician, an early anthropologist, and an early psychiatrist. And what this book argues um, and kind of forwards is the concept of moral insanity, or that being that a person could suffer from a mental infliction without clear signs of a physical disability uh, or hallucinations or delusions uh, basically arguing that someone could be unwell without a physical uh, indi indicator of such. This book is written, I forgot to put the date on there, I apologize, in 1838. And it really comes into play in Seward's political career with the William Fr Freeman trial in 1846. Uh, Seward would defend uh, William Freeman, who you can see pictured right, uh, in what would become probably the first application of Pritchard's theory in the American court of law. Um, Seward would argue that Freeman should be uh, held as a man and um, to disavow the racial prejudices of the time. Uh, Freeman was being tried for the murder of the Van Ness family. Uh, he had been uh, falsely uh, imprisoned for stealing a horse, stayed in the prison for five years, uh, during which he was beaten so severely uh, that when he came out, his family members barely recognized him. Uh, that he was oftentimes uh, having these strange conversations to himself, um, very clearly suffering uh, from his time in prison. When he goes and murders the Van Ness family, he's quickly apprehended, uh, brought to trial, and Seward defends him, arguing that he should not be executed based on this concept of moral insanity. Um, this all stems from uh, reading uh, the Treatise on Insanity by James Collis Pritchard. And if you look on the first bullet point here, um, this is kind of a really amazing resource that we're lucky to have uh, for those of us who are interested in Seward. If you go to the Seward Project, which is run by the University of Rochester, um, you can find the complete Seward Library, all the titles, as well as some notes on the state that they're in. When you find treat, uh, this treatise written by Jane Cowles Pritchard, uh, there's an inscription to William Henry Seward. You see that there are various passages marked. There are notes written in it clearly showing that Seward was engaging with this text. Um, and also it's a little bit worse for wear, spine peeling badly, including label, which has detached, uh, is filed with a piece of the spine uh, in the found in book folder. So you can actually access the Seward's library if you're looking for particular titles. But I always thought that this was a really interesting piece of history because you see Seward taking this very clear um, medical argument and applying it in the in court uh, a few years later, just kind of demonstrating how Seward wasn't just reading and forgetting, uh, it was changing the way he thought during his time. Now, following his political career, Seward uh, would continue reading um, and his interest would kind of expand, no longer focusing necessarily on political works. Uh, Seward would again reading a lot of travel and adventure reading, which is very popular during this time. Uh, during the end of the 19th century, uh, you see literature kind of focusing on it being a growing world. 
and Seward himself wants to travel. So many of the books that we see from those years um, kind of stem from this early reading of exploration and adventure. Uh, the 19th century saw a really kind of increase in literature regarding uh, exploration and travel, uh, fueled by an increase in history, uh, thanks to natural historians like Alexander von Humboldt. Uh, the Arctic was becoming of particular interest uh, following the failed Franklin expedition, which happens in the end of the 1840s, but continues to be interesting to Americans throughout the 1850s and 1860s. You have the exploits of Sir uh, Richard Francis Burton, Paul de Chalou. There's an important market for books on exploration and travel. Uh, Stewart himself tries to jump on uh, this train, eventually publishing William H. Seward's Travels Around the World uh, posthumously. He would work on this book even in the morning that he passes away in 1872. Uh, here we see some of the images taken from that book. Um, but Stuart is constantly reading with these books about exploration, about new discovery, uh, kind of influencing his own work in many ways. One of such authors that he's reading with is Paul de Chaloux. I had to shoehorn him in here because he's probably my favorite political figure. Uh, Paul de Chaloux is an explorer who is responsible for uh, substantiating the existence of the gorilla to the Western world, uh, similarly uh, with the pygmy people in Africa. Here we see a picture of Paul de Chaloux, along with one of his books that occupies uh, the Seward Libraries, Adventures in Equatorial Africa. Some of the images contained within the book, uh, of course, with those Victorian sensibilities as uh, seen to the right. Uh, Paul de Chaloux would be referenced by name in Oliver Lee Seward's uh, travel book that she published. Uh, there's two sets of books that he writes that uh, exist in the Seward Library in the drawing room. Land of the Midnight Sun and Adventures in Equatorial Africa. Um, but here, when you open Adventures in a Equatorial Africa, you actually see a signature from Paul de Chaloux uh, written to the honorary William Henry Seward in March 1872. Um, Paul de Chaloux was likely on a lecture uh, tour during this time. Uh, how him and Seward uh, met each other or were introduced is a little bit unknown at this time. Um, but for many of the books, because Auburn was such a popular spot for publishers, um, a lot of the books are signed by the authors as well, uh, which is really quite interesting. Um, so Paul de Chaloux would be a huge influence to Seward in his own travel memoirs, uh, similarly to Olive's travel book, and just some more of the adventure books that exist in the Seward Library. Uh, here we see the Arctic explorations of the second Grinnell expedition, which was looking for the missing Franklin uh, expedition. Uh, this one is pretty significant when you're looking at American history. Uh, so the Grinnell expedition starts out when Franklin's widow, uh, who was the commander of the missing Franklin expedition, reaches out to the United States to fund an uh, 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 investigation into what happened to this expedition. Uh, so this is where you start to see the United States becoming more interested in polar expedition. Uh, we see uh, more of the travel books that Seward would be reading uh, throughout his life. Uh, several of these places he would visit himself, uh, such as Egypt and the Holy Land. Uh, these books are primarily located in our drawing room, um, but really quite fascinating. Seward was reading uh, less with the narrow political focus at this point in his life and really starting to expand a little bit to international uh, topics. Excellent. And with that, I leave you with what I think is the most aesthetically pleasing book in our library. This is going to be Paul de Chaloux's uh, Land of the Midnight Sun, kind of tracing a Nordic uh, history, one of the first histories kind of exploring this mythology. Um, but beautiful book. Um, there's two parts of it. And a quote from Francis de Gus, so a taste for reading like a taste for anything else will increase and improve by cultivation. Whenever you have leisure, make a point of reading so long a time every day in some book which will give you useful knowledge. You'll soon find that that which was at first a task uh, will become an agreeable occupation. Uh, so with that, I hope you enjoyed this lecture. I hope you enjoy the series that we've been pulling together every week. Um, we're going to continue these on for as long as we can. Uh, we do ask that if you have some, uh, if you're able to, uh, any donations, any memberships are greatly appreciated. Uh, feel free to leave in the comments any books that you're reading during this time, any books that you would like to see covered. And I hope everyone's staying well, and we hope to see you in the museum uh, soon.
Thanks. Bye.